when one finds out that they are dealing with a mental illness, what do you do? Do you stay in the closet? Do you come out of the closet? In the case of our next guest, he told his husband of 20 years, Alex Goldenberg, the Reverend Alex Goldenberg of the Embodied Calm Meditation Center, welcome. Thank you. We were talking before the cameras went live. How does one make a successful marriage? As someone who's been married for 12 years, I'm, I'm always looking for advice. What's the advice as being married for 25 years? Um, well, to me, it's to stay married no matter what happens. Um, a lot of different things happen in the course of 20, 25 years. Um, a lot of challenges of, of a variety of natures, and in, our, in, my, in our case, it was my mental illness. Talk a little bit about that. So in the second decade of your, your marriage, something came up that uh, your husband wasn't expecting to deal with. Well, neither one of us was, really. I, I was diagnosed with mental illness in 1982, and I was living in Texas at the time. And I took the route that anyone would take at that time. I was di diagnosed with a bipolar disorder, and I was told that I had a chemical imbalance and that I would need to take medication, and so I did. And um, eventually, after the first couple of years, which were rocky and you know trying to match medication and see what kind of support is appropriate, um, I stabilized somewhat, and I went back to work and uh, moved out on my own again and started to make uh, social contacts. And I actually met Patrick during that time. I made no secret of being mentally ill. To me, it was not that big of a deal. Um, it was just something that I had to deal with and address, and I did. And we basically lived that way for 15 years. We moved from San Antonio, Texas, then to Austin, then to Albuquerque. Um, <clears throat> and by the time um, we were ready to leave Albuquerque and move to San Francisco, because I wanted to go to graduate school here, I was doing fine. I was on medication. Uh, still felt I, I had also developed a panic disorder, and really, mental illness is pretty ambiguous. And it's a lot of things, a lot of different things, a lot of tangential issues, one diagnosis after another, which is what happened to me, and kept trying to address it as we went along. Finally, got it all kind of straight, um, and I was feeling ready to take the next step. I'd been a manager of a um, supermarket, and I was ready to move here. I wanted to be a study psychology, especially after having had all that experience with mental illness, and I had been reading about it and learning about it and living it. Um, I wanted to really get down to the nitty gritty. So I, we moved here, and I went to uh, California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, that was in 1996 is when we moved here. And when I started graduate school, um, as happens with everyone in psychology school, my issues came up. This was an experiential program, integral counseling psychology program. And I, my issues were just right in my face. And I began to experience imbalance and just all sorts of strange symptoms once again. And the medication wasn't working. Uh, so I actually I stayed in graduate school. I did well. I uh, graduated in 1999 with a master's degree in counseling psychology, but I was really unable to function after that. I had had a caseload. I had been training for 14 months as an intern, so I had been seeing clients. And somehow I was taking on a lot of their issues, and I didn't really know how to make those separations, which is something I learned subsequently is paramount to being any kind of counselor or healer is to keep your energy separate from your client. And I wasn't doing that. So um, I ended up graduating. I started looking for work, and I just became riddled with anxiety. And I had all sorts of messages going on internally that were very conflicting and a lot of negativity, a lot of invalidating internal voices. And this is all related to how you know, I became mentally ill and sort of the history of how one goes along that trajectory, how it begins, and the family dynamic, and then a cultural dynamic, as, as well as what's going on inside of me. And um, so I applied for disability, because I knew I wouldn't be able to work. And I was in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, I had Adding to the stress. Absolutely. <laughs> I had no idea of that. I was really not aware that I was going to be in such a uh, financially challenging situation when I moved here. Um, and all these student loans to face. So um, I had been seeing a psychotherapist and a psychiatrist also for medication. And uh, we went ahead and 
got me on disability. I was lucky. It was very easy for me to get. They, they really took my, my example. You know, they, 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 they saw that you know, I must have worded it right, basically. So um, that began a, a really intense journey for me through the mental health system of this city. Which is uh, a maze, I guess, to, to put it... Uh, <sighs> a maze is almost too clear. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's chaotic. Uh -huh. it's, it was really pretty crazy. And um, before I knew it, I think by 2000, I graduated at the end of 1999. By 2002, I was seeing a psychiatrist who had put me on up to nine medications kept adding and adding and adding um, to counteract side effects and... And what impact was this having on your marriage? Well, it was devastating. Um, I was fluctuating between extraordinary anxiety and really high strung and almost catatonic depression just from the overwhelm of it all. My system would just shut down. And I was in a fog. And I was aware of it. At first, I was aware of it. And I actually admitted myself to the hospital um, early on because I knew I needed some kind of help and support. A um, couple of days of that, I could see I was not in the place I needed to be. Um, so I, I left there, and I kept seeing my, my therapist. Um, and I was getting worse and worse and worse. And my, my partner, Patrick, was really beside himself. And um, he was getting very angry and very scared. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't know, we didn't know what was going to happen. We felt like we were in the middle of the ocean. Here we are in San Francisco, away from our families. Mm -hmm. um, we really didn't know how to navigate the city very well. It's a very different energy than the mm -hmm. suburban energy that we came from. And um, I think probably, to me, the main um, issue that made it most difficult for us is the communication here in this community is very, um, very fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with electronic communication now, few words, the fewer words the better, just get the message across and go. And there was really no space for me to really get across what I was experiencing. I didn't know how to explain it, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to explore it. But and, and one of the places you ended up was dealing with the Mental Health Association of San Francisco, correct? Um, well, that's what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you got from your own diagnosis as someone who was, as I believe the statistics are, one in four people in the United States deals with mental illness, either themselves or with a family member or a loved one. How did you get from that place of uh, craziness in every way with the system, not being able to find the help you needed, to becoming actually a healer yourself and now uh, a professional helping other people? find solace. Well, that's, that's a wonderful story. I, I, I like looking back and thinking about it because it was so unconscious, really. Um, <clears throat> I was doing things to help myself. I went to graduate school. I did want to be a psychotherapist, but I really wanted to understand psychology better because I still wasn't satisfied with what was happening with me. Um, after I became really ill, I went to a meditation program uh, here in town um, that actually does um, energy work. And it's, it's not just sitting in meditation. It's a creative meditation. It's a proactive sort of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which has to do with actually looking, seeing your issues and working with that visually and looking at it from a spiritual perspective, which was a new thing for me. That's when I began to kind of turn a corner with my perspective and see that there was some sort of pathway that could lead me out of this. And do you think that your commitment to becoming a healer yourself helped heal you? Well, the commitment was to healing myself, and as uh -huh. a result, I became a healer. Right. Now, we've been talking about your, your struggle and your path and dealing with a partnership of 25 years. Uh, you're fortunate that you have a relationship that weathered that storm. Mm -hmm. Do you think, two questions, um, is there a stigma against mental illness in the gay community more than in the community at large? And two, uh, do you think a lot of couples are dealing with this issue and just in the closet about it? Well, let me answer the second one first, because to me that's very clear. Um, I think a lot of people are in self-denial about it. 
what we call mental illness is very, very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. It's not one thing. Well, it's not one thing, and I think, a, a, you know, most people deal with some kind of mental illness. You, one in four is probably a diagnosed mental illness. Um, mental illness is in many ways analogous to physical illness. We all can get mental colds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mental illness specifically, in, you know, the way I see it, it's when your mind is not able to focus to the point where you can't really function. And that might even be for one day. Mm -hmm. Now it becomes diagnosable according to the DSM over, after a certain period of time and all that stuff. But, um, but really we all, you know, a grief can cause temporary mental illness, um, stress, which everyone deals with, anxiety, can, can create blocks to our ability to focus. To me, that's mental illness. Mm -hmm. There's emotional imbalances, and often that's part of it because when we can't focus, we become more stressed. Right. But that has something in Chinese medicine, and this is where I began to shift my perspective and what I'm teaching now. Uh -huh. The mind is the the brain isn't what creates emotions. That comes from our body. Right. Um, in just our last few moments, we're going to go a little bit long in this interview because I want you to tell me specifically what your perception of is how mental illness is accepted or not accepted within the gay community. Do you think the gay community has yet to come out of the closet dealing with this issue? We've talked a lot about AIDS in various communities, but I don't see a lot of work being done in the gay community around issues of mental illness. Would you think that was true? Well, I think that could very possibly be the case, um, mainly because there's so many other issues. Right. There's the drug abuse and there's HIV AIDS. Right. Um, all of that's going to create mental illness. Before we close, tell me again the name of your center. It is the? Embody Calm Meditation Center. We will actually be happy to have uh, Reverend Alex Goldenberg back. Uh, next up, we're going to be speaking with uh, Dr. Andrew Brown about his landmark film, Word is Out. We'll be right back.